<laughs> Thanks, Tim. <Tim. laughs> the last, I guess the last time I came to a club such as this <coughs> to have lunch was 65 years ago. My father had died during the war, and my mother wanted to come out to Wichita to see old friends. We lived in Delaware. So we br I brought her out, along with my brother, older brother. And Dad's old friends invited my brother and I to lunch at a club downtown. And the hosts included Ralph Rounds of Rounds and Porter, um, Frank Priest of Delaney Johnson and Priest Insurance Company, Merle Bennett, who ran the Bennett Music Store, Don Cooper, and Dr. Mag. They had all grown up in Wichita. And so for two hours, my brother and I sat and listened to people who had known each other since they were very little, reminisce about growing up in Wichita. And it was a very moving moment for me. Of course, now I'm the patriarch and talking to you a bit about myself, but I really want to talk about my grandfather. I'm going, to, I'm going to refer to him in various ways as A.A. or as my grandfather or and occasionally as Bert, which is the way what his family called him. Um, he was born in a little town in western Massachusetts called Lee, Massachusetts. He was one of three boys and six girls born to Alexander Hyde. And this is the earliest photograph we have of him. He is. He is, uh, which is the, no, I'm going back, sorry. Oh, there it is. This is, this is AA, and this is George. George was six years older. Man, man. I'll get it. And the house they were born in um, still stands, and I lived in that. Um, it housed not only the family, uh, a large family, but it, <laughs> it included a boarding school run by AA's father. He had gone to college, and when you finished college in 1833, he had two choices. You could become a preacher or a school teacher. And so he went and taught in the village school and leave for a little bit, and then he decided he would start a boarding school in his own home. His wife almost killed him at that point <laughs> because she had to cook and prepare for um, all the meals and everything for these young men. It was all men who came, many of whom came from the Sandwich Islands, which we now call Hawaii. Um, and so it was a kind of semi-missionary group. A's um, father had an a, a, a idea of education. I'd love to do a paper on it. There's not enough of it. What you and I would call progressive education. He, he didn't believe in just, you know, memorizing the multiplication tables. You should learn how to, how to, how to work and how a farm works. So if you went to that school, recess was working in the fields. Um, and you began to learn what would be um, what Alexander Hyde called um, scientific agriculture. That is, they were beginning to learn about manure, and he would write articles on manure and the advantages of manure, and it would be published, and it would move on in that. Now, no, sorry, I'll get it yet. Um, this is Burton George in 1865. George went to war. Um, he was in the, in the Union Army, he was a captain, and he fought in all the battles of the, of the Civil, the major battles of the Army of the Potomac. Um, and what happened in those years in New England is that when the war came to an end, George didn't really want to go back to Lee. There really wasn't much to do in these small towns. And you went west. 
and you had connections. And he said to his youngest brother, whom they call Bert, AA, Bert, you're going to finish high school in June of 1865. Come on out too. And come on out and join me. And they went to the city of Leavenworth. I always like this picture of Leavenworth. I don't know how well this comes across to you all. But Bert joined him in the summer of 1865. We tend to romanticize frontier towns and think, you know, they had sort of nice yards and, and good Victorian houses. They were real trash heaps because when you got in there and tried to start building a town, the hell with what the architecture was, get a roof over your head. Uh, it wasn't a very easy place to live. And grandfather luckily wrote a diary and he would talk about moving from boarding house to boarding house, um, where they'd serve better food than they had at the other. But the question was, how did you occupy your spare time? And he and his brother um, did something that uh, I think uh, is an important piece of Kansas history. They decided with a group of five other men that they would start a baseball club. But there was no place for the baseball club to play baseball. So they had to buy some land, and land was fairly easy, but in order to buy the land, they had to form a corporation. And so they got, got it together, raised $500, and purchased a lot in Leavenworth and um, said this lot is going to be for the Frontier Baseball Club. And so that becomes the first chartered baseball club in the state of Kansas. Um, they would play on weekends with other towns. Baseball, by the way, the game was quite different than it is now. It, it did not require gloves. And when grandfather would try and play, go down and play baseball with his sons, he considered them all sissies because um, they, they, they wore gloves. But in any case, they would travel around. They'd go over into Missouri to play towns near Leavenworth. And grandfather notes in his diary that in 1867, the Frontier Baseball Club went over to um, uh, uh, some town in Missouri and he writes in it, it was a red town. There were no US flags flying on the 4th of July and all the songs were red songs. Um, so the, the Civil War was still very much in the lives of the people at that time um, in their work. Okay, now I wanna pull out if I can, something. This is uh, what, when AA comes to Wichita, you'll excuse me for a minute. No, you won't. Um, and he was, he had worked in a bank in Leavenworth. Uh, he'd had to take penmanship lessons for cheap for $5 a month because his penmanship was awful and he blamed it on his father's education. His father didn't think it was necessary to teach young men how to write, and so it was a kind of scrawl. So the bank said, we can't read your writing, so you have to go and take penmanship lessons. Um, and he did, and he became a banker. He was a, a, a young officer of a bank in Leavenworth, and the owner liked him. And he said, now look, there's a new town growing up down on the Arkansas and it's gonna grow, and they're gonna need banks. And I'm gonna send you down there. And you're gonna become the cashier of the Wichita Savings Bank. A cashier wasn't the person that stood behind and did the money, the cashier was, was an officer of the bank. So AA's professional training was as a banker. And he goes down and he, um, goes into the Wichita Savings Bank there, and it was located in the Eagle Building on the corner, uh, it's the southeast corner of Maine and Douglas. It was the only stone building in the city. 
And I, what I was looking for, there's a wonderful article in a DAR um, leaflet that was made in 1914, which described the various um, institutions which used this building. They included not only the Wichita Savings Bank, they included the U.S. Post Office, the Presbyterian Church, the office of the, pre the, of the pastor of the Presbyterian Church, stores for food, China. Upstairs there was a large reception room which the town used for dances, for parties, and for receiving important people who came. Those are the ones I can remember. But all of these were included in this stone building. So A.A. A. Hyde got to know everybody in Wichita um, by being part of this bank as a young man. He's 24 years old. Um, and it was, a, it was a young man's town. Inevitably, he fell in love. And his bride, his bride lived across, uh, uh, down on first, and I get, I get confused because Broadway was Lawrence. And so everything was referred to as Lawrence in the, in the thing. And he met a young woman, and John Todd and I talked about this briefly. Her name was Ida Elizabeth Todd. And she was Mary Todd Lincoln's third cousin. Her father ran a wholesale grocery store in Wichita called um, Todd and Royal. Uh, and it was down on first and, or second and, it was, it was right near where, where the, uh, the center of town was. It didn't go very far. Um, and so they were married in 1875. Um, they uh, mentioned it later, they celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary and all nine of their children were present on that occasion in 1925. Um, the, um, the, the raising of a family was, was always a, a problem of, of how did you get enough money. He was paid about $400 a month by the bank. But if you wanted to do extra money, you invested in land. That is, real estate was the way to get money. And so what you would do is you would buy. So he built a house at first in Topeka. Um, he had to add a second floor as more children came into being. Um, and he was looking for other ways to raise money. And so he bought up a plot which still exists called Hyde's Edition. And what you did, you would, you would buy up the plot, you would plot it into, into lots that you would sell, um, and that would be the income you would have, and people would take out mortgages or whatever it would be. So it was a, it was a fundraising deal. But it also gave him the chance to name streets, name, to put his name on Wichita and his thing. And they're still there. Ida Street is his wife. I, I'm not sure I'm going to remember them all. Lulu McCabe was um, the wife of the Presbyterian minister. She was Lulu McCabe Hewitt. Uh, Patty was his sister-in-law. Patty married George Strong, who was the founder of the Fourth National Bank. Um, I should add that my aunt, Patty, different. Every time the name of George Strong went, came up, she would say, yeah, well, he went wrong. <laughs> His business practices evidently were not exactly within the law. Um, then um, there was a... Um, a, a Ella Street, and I'll skip that for the moment. And then my favorite, Fanny Street. Now, in, in, in the time that, that AA built this property, Fanny was a perfectly proper women's name, and a very popular one. 
In the 20th century, it has, has other connotations. <laughs> and therefore, the residents of Fanny Street in the 1930s petitioned the city council to change the name of Fanny Street. It had been named after, by the way, the daughter of Hiram Lewis, the president of the Kansas National Bank, which at that time AA was working for. And, uh, <coughs> and the city council, it seemed to me, exercised great kindness. It's told Mr. Hyde that the, name, the people on the street, they could change the name, but only after Fanny died. And so when she died, it became Greenwood Street. Bill Ellington and I once thought of starting a club uh, of Restore Fanny Street. <laughs> I don't think it would have gone very far. But <laughs> now, the, what was going to change uh, AA's life was, as a developer, was the building of the streetcar line from, uh, along Douglas Avenue and out to Hillside. The electric line. Before that, there'd been horse-drawn, but they didn't go that far. That meant they were going to open up the eastern part of the, of the, of the town. Um, and A.A. saw, since he had gotten into real estate, that he would have a place where he could invest more money. So, uh, once the trolley got started, AA did something which is quite unlike him. He went to the bank and he said, I'm resigning. I'm no longer going to be the ca cashier of the Kansas National Bank, and I am going to become a loan broker. That's a nice way of saying I'm going to become a land speculator. Um, and I'm going to make a fortune that way. And so he plotted, and I'm going to, um, he plotted this area. This is, here is, here is um, the trouble is they, they changed the names of the street to what they are today. This is Prospect Street. This is, um, uh, I forget what they call this one, but this, this area right up here had belonged to a farmer named Moser. And Moser had an orchard. And I remember as a child, happened, since I happened to live up there, the last remnants of the orchard were there um, on the lot. And on the, the northeast corner, and I'm going to use contemporary terms, of Second and Roosevelt, uh, it, this Moser Avenue became Roosevelt in 1908. Um, AA built not just a house, he built a house. He hired Proudfoot and Bird, the great architects of Wichita, to build him a proper house. Um, and this is what it looked like. And it, again, we talk about architecture, this was the architectural jewel of the time and it had porches and it had all kinds of things but what I want you to notice first of all notice the trees the first thing you did was to have trees because there was no shade on the other hand you had an absolutely spectacular view looking out to the west over the city of Wichita which was quite a distance from there if you drive down Kellogg today and you come around that corner up around College Hill, you suddenly see the city of Wichita in front of you. Now there's a lot of trees in there, but that's what it, so he called it Hillcrest. And that's where the Hillcrest Apartments at a later point took the name. Then with his brother, the crooked one, I mean his brother-in-law, the crooked one, George Strong, he, um, he bought up land on the other side of the Frisco tracks to create a cemetery. Because grandfather figured that would be a money maker. People die, they have to buy lots, they have to pay for perpetual care, and so this will be a cash cow for the family. And therefore it got laid out. He also included in it a Civil War 
memorial and made it possible for any veteran who, who wished to be buried there um, to, in, the, in the lots around that. It was falling apart, some of you may remember. It's been restored. It's a wonderful piece of Wichita history that's been restored and they've also identified, I think, all the graves that surround it and where, you know, the units they were with and that kind of thing. Finally, in terms of his development, he decided that he loved books and he loved to read to his children. And so he started down on Main Street Hyde and Humble Bookstore. And it was more than just a bookstore. Grandfather didn't run it. A guy named Ike Humble really ran it. But Humble um, didn't run a very good store, I would figure. But Grandfather loved it because he could order all the books that he wanted to read to his children. And one of the things he'd do on Saturdays, on a lovely Saturday like this, he would take my father and his, and my, his youngest daughter, and they would walk down to the river, and he would take a book to read. He loved Dickens. And a whole big bag of peanuts, unshelled peanuts. And so grandfather would read to them, and they would eat peanuts, and when the peanuts were gone, they go home. Um, and that was how Saturday got spent uh, in the Hyde House. Now, then uh, Becky mentioned Mar uh, Marsh Murdoch's busting, the bust that came. And all of a sudden, all of this disappeared. And he had no money. And he had nine children and a maiden aunt, the born Aunt Jane. She was born in 1818. She was illiterate, uh, but she took care of the children, the little ones. While my grandmother, this, I don't know whether any of you knew any of the Hyde men or their children. One that's interesting is Alex Hyde over here. He is the father of Sally Hyde, who became Sally Hyde Corbin, and was uh, the wife, as she told me, the last first lady of the University of Wichita. Um, and Corbin is there. That was Uncle Alex. But they had three daughters, Mary, um, the character in the family, Ruth, um, and Patty. Aunt Ruth's my favorite, and I remember her. She, we loved her. And she was the, ma the maverick in the family. And when they would have annual meetings, her six brothers would arrive in town, and they were pretty tough birds. And they would say to her, Ruth, for heaven's sakes, why do you smoke on the street? You know father wouldn't like you to smoke. Or, you know, why do you wear rouge? That's, the, the father wouldn't like that. And Aunt Ruth would always say, Jordy, I know it. I don't know why I do it. And, and she continued doing it. <laughs> Everybody loved Ruth, uh, including all of us kids. And she would bring you back strange presents from her, from her travels. Now, it's at this point I move from the development period to the entrepreneur. My the title that John gave me was threefold. He, he had to find a way to make money. The, the cemetery, bless its heart, didn't provide enough money to really support the family, even though he made his son spend the weekends watering the trees in the, in the cemetery because it was supposed to look like a park. Um, so he and two men formed a, uh, agreed that they would each put $200 into the pot, and one of the men knew how to make soap from the yucca plant. There must be some liquid that comes out and, and he knew the formula. And he said, we can sell yucca soap. And so they each put $200 into the, the kitty and they started making yucca soap. They went around town, went to the druggist. Remember, it's before Walgreens and that kind of thing. It was each section of the town would have a drugstore, a pharmacist. 
and they would go in and then they discovered it would help to add something to offer the druggist to put on his shelves beside yucca soap. So they would have boot black and, and various cleaning devices and things that they would walk around. Well, uh, as time went on, they were looking for other ways of, of um, doing this and this is again talk about women um, then they decided the two guys that were with him they said we're not making them up money we're getting out we'll leave our two hundred dollars for you but it began to take off a bit and so they issued stock it was to become a stock company and AA was to have 25 stock Dewey Wheeler briefly had 25. He was the one that had the formula for the yucca soap, and he said, no, I didn't want to do any more about it. Then Ida Hyde had 10 shares, and she became the secretary treasurer of the company. Um, as well as, but Aunt Jane did a lot of things. T.I. Humble, who helped run the, help, uh, Hyde and Humble. A.C. Jobes was the president of the Kansas National Bank. And Helen Smith, who had two, was a, uh, a, uh, um, a sister of A.A. A. Hyde. Now, one of the products they decided to sell, this kind of thing, it was called Vest Pocket Cough Specific. I have an original bottle, still has the stuff in it, a lot of alcohol. <laughs> but it also had menthol in it. And it, what, it, its sale was to people who gave long talks and who needed, you know, some restorative. So you would put it in your vest pocket and when necessary you would turn your back to the crowd, pull out the vest pocket little bottle, take a swig, put it back in and continue talking. And it worked. Grandfather decided that he was interested in menthol and he also didn't like the alcohol part of it. He was a teetotaler and, and had been all his life. So <coughs> he, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> he then began to fiddle. He liked to fiddle. And he uh, said menthol, you know, that could make a good salve. But I got to figure out a way that it'll hold its consistency. So he used the kitchen stove at home to try and figure out what combination of components would, would create a salve that would hold. And then he would take it around to the druggists in Wichita and say, you want to try this? See if it works. See if it holds its constituency. It's, cons yeah, it's, it's solid. And they, they agreed to do it. And it began to work. And he had to have a name. Now, in, in naming it, he wanted to avoid the kind of snake oil uh, remedies that were on the market, you know. Uh, well, one of the more reasonable ones was, say, Lydia Pinkham's Pink Pills. But you would name it after the person, you know, A.A. Hyde's Menthol Sab or something. He would have none of that. He wanted people to take it seriously and to say this will not cure anything, but it will help you to breathe when you have a cold or sniff your nose. Um, so I'm gonna call it mentholatum. And it was a combination of menthol and petrolatum, or latum, I don't know which it is, which was the major constituencies in, in the salve. There's nothing very fancy about it. it well, it's the earliest of them, so Vicks always claims, you know, but we children learn how to swear by saying, oh, Vicks. <laughs> uh. Now, as methylatum continued to develop, you can see from the stationery, I've got pieces of stationery, what was happening. You begin with the Yucca Company, then you have the Yucca Company with mentholatum, the Yucca Company, and then it becomes more and more that mentholatum is the product.
of, that's, that's used. Um, and even the store down on East Douglas has uh, the Yucca Company's uh, plant, it's, it says the Mentholatum Company. So grandfather, by 1906, says, all right, uh, heck with the Yucca Company. We're making money on Mentholatum, so I'm going to close this plant, and I'm going to build a new one. And of course, as you know, it's still there. Um, it's the Spice Merchant. And in, in this building, um, he used his, again, talents as a fiddler. It's the first pre-stressed concrete building in the city of Wichita. And it also was the first to have an attempt at air conditioning because it's a flat roof. And he would have a hose and he would spray water on the top roof, which would, would make it cooler in the building. As a result, mental item took off. Um, and as an entrepreneur, suddenly he was a great success. And, and to a certain degree, he was worried about this. Uh, he, he wasn't, he was pleased that it was successful, but he felt that he was getting money that he probably didn't deserve. And as a consequence of that, um, he worked very hard to figure out how to spend the money that he was making because he didn't need it all. Now that doesn't mean he's gonna wear sackcloth and ashes and you know, go around and, and look poor, but he wanted to live a good life. But he didn't, he didn't feel he wanted to um, really just make money. So what he did, he took half of the stock in Mentholatum that he owned, and he created what you and I would call a foundation. And it was called the Hyde Benevolent Society. And it, it was money, it turned out money, and it was money that was to be given away. And so A.A. A. said to his sons, and here we come more into the philanthropy, all right, boys, you run the company. I'm going to give away money. Um, and he began his philanthropy with the Hyde Benevolent Society. And I'm going to go through fairly quickly some of the Wichita uh, parts of that that he um, uh, followed. First of all, we passed it coming up. The Masonic was originally meant to be the YMCA. Uh, and he had, he had pledged $2,500 to it. Now the crash came and he mortgaged his house so he could pay for it. He loved the YMCA. The problem was the YMCA couldn't afford the building. And so it sold it to the Masonic Order and it remains where it is. I think it's been preserved in very good ways by the company. Then the Presbyterian Church of which he was a member had outgrown its original church and so it needed to build a new one. And so he said, okay, I'll buy some land for you and uh, we'll, we can get it set up. But it was a controversy in the church because <laughs> which says something about how a town works, he, he, it meant that you had to walk four blocks from the streetcar to get to this church, when the original church was right at the corner um, and you just got off the streetcar and went to church. And so the people in the east part of town were upset. And so in a very, and with AA's help, he said, okay, that's all right. Um, we'll build a new church in the east part of town, which is Grace Presbyterian Church. And guess where it was originally? It's up on the top of the hill now. It was behind the mental item company. And obviously AA gave to it, and he and Ida remained the basic uh, supporters of Grace Presbyterian Church. The children continued to go to the first Presbyterian Church. This is my favorite. 
of all of his contributions, and it's one that I continue. He was very concerned about African American children, particularly in the South, who were not being educated. And he met a young man, a young African American, named Lawrence Jones. And Lawrence Jones lived in the Mississippi Delta. And he created a school called the Piney Woods School, whose purpose was to educate the young African Americans living in the Delta and teach them to read and write, and also to teach them a trade. Um, and in order to raise money, and, and AA contributed regularly, but then the way they raised money, they set up a singing group of students who would sing spirituals, hymns, and would travel around in vacations um, and give concerts and, and ask for contributions. But as you can imagine, the question was where do they eat and where do they stay? Because the hotels and the restaurants would be barred to them. So A.A. Fiddler designed this uh, Cotton Blossom Singer's truck. They didn't live in it, but it had stoves. W.C. Coleman gave them a stove they could put in it. Um, you could open it up at the back and they could pull out tables. And then that way they could camp wherever they were going. Um, and there would be tents inside and they could cook their meals and not go through the humiliation of, of being rejected. Um, and so the Cotton Blossom Singers and Piney Wood School still remember uh, A. A. Hyde and one of the dormitories is named after him there. I'm going to add one piece because my dad had something to do with it. My father always wanted to, to be a rancher. Um, and he was wounded in the First World War and he came back. He met my mom and they bought a farm outside of Wichita then on Sullivan. And the local uh, pediatricians urged him to create a dairy that could produce very safe raw milk. I, I don't understand the reasons for this, but it was very hard to get safe raw milk, not pasteurized. But that meant you had to have an incredibly clean uh, dairy. Well, he did it. He bought the, he bought a, the, the milk cows, but it, it didn't pay off. The, the hospitals couldn't afford the cost. And so dad said, okay, I'll give the herd to Piney Wood School. So they loaded the entire herd of cows onto Santa Fe uh, cars and sent it down to Mississippi and to this day it remains, the heirs of it, remains the herd for the school. The other thing he loved to do, particularly after he stopped hunting, he didn't hunt, his, his youngest, his uh, middle son Charlie had been coming back from a hunting trip and uh, he was leaning on his gun and it had gone through his arm and he never was able to use his arm again. He played golf with one arm. It was fascinating to watch play. Great strength with it. Um, in any case, he loved to fish. And he was old enough, the firm was getting along. He went out to Estes Park, Colorado in 1907. And three men out there um, got together and they said, you know, employees of the YMCA don't have really very much of a place to go because we don't pay them very much. Uh, we ought to set up a particularly kind of resort for them. So he did, and it's called today YMCA of the Rockies in, a, in Estes Park, Colorado. But then grandfather said to his employees, look, here's your choice. You can spend, uh, I'll give you two weeks paid vacation, or I'll give you a 10 day visit to the YMCA of the Rockies, um, all expenses paid, I'll get you out there and back, I'll give you $25 spending money. Um, and having known some of the employees myself who had gone this, I remember one said to me, John, I, I was called Johnny Mike, Johnny Mike, that was the first time I was out of the state of Kansas. Um, and they remembered it, and the guest book 
is a wonderful guest book, which is going to be in the archives of, uh, that I've set up out at WSU, um, has all these largely women reporting of what a wonderful vacation this had been, that the first time they had really been away for such a visit. Now, I want to talk briefly here about his philanthropy and the response to it. And it's a lovely one. And I, I, I have to spend a little time. What time are we going? Oh, we're all right. This is a picture of an evangelist. I doubt most of you here would know who this is. Her name was Amy Semple McPherson. And she was a woman evangelist. And she went around to, to camp meetings and things. And she once preached a subject on a sermon on the subject of A.A. Hyde, and a copy of it was sent to him, and I found it pasted in his scrapbook. And here's what she said. Uh, it, these are selections from it. A, Mr. A. A. Hyde entered into a definite contract with the Lord, who immediately began to prosper him. With the wealth which he received from this contract, Mr. Hyde had two missionaries financed in India, a missionary steamboat in Africa, three missionaries in China, several missionaries in Japan. While I stand here preaching this afternoon, his missionary steamboat is chug, chug, chugging through the waters of the coast and the rivers, bearing missionaries to preach the word to those who live in darkness. Therefore, when A. A. Hyde began to tithe and to exceed the traditional tenth in his contributions, the Lord prospered him in a wonderful way, changing him from a penniless, deeply indebted man to a multimillionaire. At the bottom of it, A. A. Hyde wrote, all bosh. <laughs> That was not what he thought was he. Now, in his old age, he had become an advocate of what was called the gospel of wealth. It wasn't a very sophisticated idea, but it, it was an idea that anyone who earned more money than they needed to make a living, a reasonable living, um, and kept it and saved it if when that person died with that money and savings died disgraced and it sounds sort of hokey but on the other hand grandfather believed it and so in 1928 he said to his sons I'm going to dissolve the Hyde Benevolent Society and you can have all the shares of the mental item company but you must pay me cash no notes, nothing else, because I want to give that money away before I die. So I do not die disgraced. And so for the next seven years, that's what he did. He sat in his office down there on Douglas Avenue. People would come to him. He would say, come back, bring your spreadsheets, show me what your overhead is and why. What are you doing to help people? And if he thought it was a good idea, he'd give them the money. And that's spread all around the world. Um, and he wanted to be sure that he did not die disgraced. As a consequence, the city of Wichita did something I don't think it's ever done before or after. It decided to give a civic banquet to which all the people of Wichita would be invited. And it was to honor A.A. Hyde and his contributions, not only to the city of Wichita, uh, but to the world and to the uh, people around it. It was held at the Forum, which was down, was a sort of big auditorium downtown was cooked by five women in five churches, and anybody could come. They had speakers. And the eagle celebrated it in this drawing, because I like the drawing, because it tells you many of the, the charities that he gave to. I mean, here you can see Friends University, Fairmount College, 
uh, Estes Park, European Student Relief, uh, Boys Country Club, Chinese Mission, Mexican Mission. These were often mission churches, by the way, in Wichita um, that were there. And so the, the city recognized him. Well, he, uh, he, he lived uh, eight more years. Um, died very gently in 1935, no suffering. And at his request, he was buried at Sunset. He loved Sunset, not in his home in Lee, but in good Kansas ground in Maple Grove Cemetery. And he planned it all. And the grave is marked by a small stone. Gives his, his name and his wife's name. But I, if you do see it, there's a marble bird bath. And his sons asked that the bird bath be made of marble that is quarried in Lee, Massachusetts. So the other, the larger marker on the grave where my father and mother are buried um, is from Lee, is a testament to his roots. This also indicates his long association with the Jewish community in, in Wichita, which held a memorial service for him at the synagogue at that time. There are only three institutions in Wichita that bear his name, and they are most appropriate. One is Hyde Park. The park down in the original part of town, the Hyde edition, he saved that out, he didn't sell lots, because he said people who live in these areas need some shady place to sit on summer afternoons. So he created Hyde Park. Secondly, he created Camp Hyde uh, out on the Little River, and he was particularly hopeful that that would help children who were hard of hearing. My Grandmother Hyde uh, was totally deaf by the time she died. Um, and so grandfather was always interested in Martin Palmer's Institute of Low PD um, and other things dealing with people who are hard of hearing. And that was part of it. And finally, the Hyde Magnet School, Hyde School. I am an alumnus of Hyde School. I spoke there yesterday to the entire school. And it was wonderful. Uh, the kids were very responsive in whatever they were. I'm going to close with a photograph that my mother took of A.A. Hyde and me. The lifespan of these two individuals covers the entire history of this city. From 1872 to right now. Um, it serves to remind us not only how old we are as a city, but from another perspective, how young we are. I'm proud of having a role in building a new city library. I know it's controversial. Any project that costs that much money is going to be controversial. But it is an institution which serves all the people and provides access to knowledge that they, none of us individually could collect. I know my grandfather would have given generously and I have tried to follow his example. Ladies and gentlemen, you are the ones to carry on. Good luck and Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you. We got plenty. Yeah, no, we got enough time, John. So ask questions. I'll try to quit crying. My brother, Jimmy Roselle, had a brain tumor, and he grew up on a high property. And I very much appreciate your family. I grew up on Bluff Street. Oh, okay. <laughs>
Anybody else? And if somebody, if, if, if some of you would feel you have to leave, please leave. Or if some of them sort of wait around and talk to me privately, do that. I don't have to be out of here till about another 20 minutes, I think. I got to I got to give another talk and a different one. Becky's. Thank you so much for uh, speaking to us today. My question is on the cemetery that you were referring to in the talk. Yeah. Was that a denominational cemetery or was that open to all denominations? I, I do family history work and I was shocked to learn how strict they were about denominational cemeteries. I mean, if you weren't a baptized Christian, you had to be buried outside the fence and all of this stuff. Uh, and, and they were very strict about that. I'm not sure that, that occurred here in Wichita. No. Well, oh, sorry. Uh, Maple Grove Cemetery had no, no denominational. It was not affiliated with any church. Okay. Uh, it, was a pri <laughs> it was a private money-raising uh, <laughs> institution in some way. <laughs> when it was first. I, I, Whoops. I remain an owner of Maple Grove Cemetery. I don't know what the heck's happened to all the stock, but many <laughs> years ago, <laughs> it was all turned over to the city. And so if anybody wants to check on my wealth, uh, <laughs> be that. Yeah, is there somebody back there? Dr. Hyde, I wanted to ask you about the progress of the special collections on your grandfather at Wichita State. Oh. oh it's coming. Here's what I, I was persuaded to do, and I, I, I say this because I'm very pleased with it, but I'm going to add a general piece of advice to all of you. I ended up, for reasons that are too much to explain, with all kinds of material relating to mentholatum and the Hyde family which when we moved from here, moved from place to place. Um, and it was my luck, in part, to uh, find it and to keep it. And now I decided where it needs to be is in a university uh, library or university collection, because it can be indexed and it can be used by other people. So in the remaining years of my life, what I'm doing is going through 10 photograph albums and putting a number on each page and on each page numbering the pictures and say, then type up, I am literate in computers, thank God, um, <laughs> put the identity of the place and the people when I know it in the picture and then send it off to WSU. Uh, so there will be an index of pictures and of articles like the Amy Semple McPherson business about all Bosch. That was in his scrapbook. There's a diary. That's a WSU. So I'm trying to collect all that Kansas-Wichita relationship and feel wonderful about it uh, and urge people to Remember, if you just give it sometimes to small local historical societies, that's wonderful. But they don't have the facility or the money to preserve them. And a, a great library like the new library or the Abla Library at, at the university, it will be able to not only preserve them and take care of them, I've got some wonderful posters. Uh, so I showed to the medical society I spoke to I said, I've only got one poster that's medical. And it was, it's a picture of a little nurse. And the, it was a long time, very successful ad, because mentholatum was called the little nurse for little ills. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so they will get all that material. And, and, and so I urge you to do it. And they've been very helpful. grandchildren, great-grandchildren, or great-great-grandchildren uh, are descended from uh, your grandfather and even your, I guess it would be your great-great-uncle who were here in Wichita. And any estimate in terms of that number and, and how many of them are still here in the Wichita? It's a good question. Sally Hyde was the last to live here. And uh, Sally Hyde Corbin. Um, all, everybody else moved away some much earlier. Um, 
I think S Sally Hyde has, long dead, has a granddaughter here, but I've not met her. But that would be the closest. She's Kim or one of the, one of Harry's and, and Sally's son's kid. <laughs> but no, they, they all left. That's one of the reasons I came back. Uh, I felt we owed something. Over there. Um, on your map there, is that have any relation to your family or is that No, I didn't hear him. Does Hydraulic Street have any relationship to your family or is that just a coincidence? No. Sorry. <laughs> um, I would say that a guy named Leahy worked for the Eagle many years ago. He used to always complain about the Hyde boys. One of the games you played on Halloween or times was to grease the rails of the, of the trolley. Um, and that meant that the trolley couldn't climb the hill. Um, and the Hyde boy would then hide in the bushes um, to watch the the engineer desperately tried to get the thing pushed up the hill. <laughs> yes, sir. I wanted to tell you another remedy that you brought up a ventilator <laughs> did for me. Uh, I broke out with hives from penicillin, and I was in the hospital, and the gal next to me in the other bed had pneumonia. Well, they were trying to get a salve to put on me that would relieve my itching. I put mentholitum all over the my body where they were, and the gal next door breathed better. <laughs> <laughs> and I was relieved from itching from eyes. I think it was the greatest stuff. I don't <laughs> AA, AA like little dog roll verses. I wish I could have shared so I didn't have enough. I, I now realize that I had more time than I thought. But I've saved some of them, some of which we memorized as kids. Hot pavement, sore feet, mentholatum, what a treat. <laughs> if I think of any more. It's nasal irritation when you sniff and snuff a bit. Use a little mentholatum and you'll never suffer it. <laughs> It ain't Shakespeare. <laughs> what a grand gentleman. Let's give Dr. John Hyde a standing thank you. We love you, buddy. You're great. <laughs> You're fun. <laughs>